in Scotland, Dundee. And today I'm going to show you how to do a basic immersion method of dyeing. Now there are plenty of other ones out there, um, I just want to show you how I do it. I have done the tutorial already, and I did that on um, hand painting yarn. This one is just on immersion using one colour, but I'm going to show you on two different places. Um, so, your checklist. You will need one to have cleaned the kitchen or the area you are working in. Remove all foodstuffs, drinking stuff, and get that out of the way. What you'll also need to do is clean the sink. You will need to scrub it, make sure there's no food debris, there's nothing there that will affect the yarn because I personally soak my yarn in the sink. You can use chug buckets, anything you've got, make sure it's clean, grease, dirt, food, everything will do. And if you're using cleaning chemicals like bleaches, make sure you rinse the sink out so that when it goes in, it's just going into the water and into the acid. You'll also need a dye of your choice. So I use Jacquard for the most part. And today I'm going to be showing you how to dye teal. So my colour ray is, that would be tealan. There we go, teal. So there are no secrets I'm giving away. It's not mystifying or secretive. It's basically, this is how I do it and how I use my concentration calculations in order to work out the colour I want in the end. Um, there are people out there who don't like washed out colours apparently, or don't like strong colours, so you can chop and choose, you can decide how strong and how concentrated or how dilute you want. You will also need some citric acid, which I use for vinegar, white vinegar. Um, not malt, not balsamic, this is just basic vinegar, colourless. I only use vinegar if I'm dyeing my Stellina bases. There are reports out there that the citric acid contains some of the shine from the Stellina. I personally haven't found it to be completely true, but I don't want to take a risk. I don't use, you can use vinegar for all your dyeing. I'm not mad on the smell, mixed with the wet wool. I would rather have a more enjoyable work space. You will also need a large stainless steel pot. It has to be stainless steel. If you use things like Teflon coated, enamel coated, um, some of the cheaper ones have like a non-sticky type thing that doesn't work with non-stick and just comes off. All the dyes and the acids that you use will react with the chemicals that are embedded in the surface and will change the, prop uh, the property of the dyes and you don't want to do that and you'll also cause things you can cause things to break away from the pot and you can sometimes re-dissolve them and get new ones. So use stainless steel. It has to be large enough so that you can, if you're doing an immersion method, that you want to have the skein more or less in an open roll so that it, it can take the dye out. I have a wooden spoon that I use only for dyeing. It's the same as a pot and anything else you use for dyeing, things like the bottles, a salad spinner, this is all just dying. This is all just dying. There is no food drink in contact with it at all. You'll also need a mask. I probably won't use one today just because I'm only doing one bottle of teal um, and I can do it quick enough. Um, these bottles are quite handy. Um, they hold 500 milliliters and I know that my stop point solution I know how much to add to get the same effect every time. What I also have here is I've organised my dyeing space today. Sorry about the wobbling. And what you can see here are my cabinets that I have and they're filled with my dyes. So the jacquard dyes are numbered. So this one says 631 and what we've done is taken small samples of yarn and we've dyed them. So this one is Aztec gold and it's numbered 633. So I have 
Okay, you have the numbering starts at zero. So here's one, six, zero, one. Six, zero, one. So this drawer contains all of the six zeros. Then it's the six ones. Six, two, six, three, and that's as far as they go. So I know that if this one is six, three, three, I go to this three drawer, and here is the pot of Aztec gold. Six, three, three. And I know the colour of my, the way I have set up the dyeing. Excuse the dog. Again. Okay. You'll also need some kind of wool wash. I like to use a scented uh, washing liquid, but it's very dilute and it doesn't get wool and it's still, but it imparts a nice little odour at the end. I like a fruity one. You will also need the vinegar I've talked about, and this is just food grade citric acid. Um, it's just bog standard. You can probably touch it with your bare hands and you're not going to get anything. It looks like sugar. It's food grade. It comes in different forms, this was ordered in, and this is just a different version, but it's the same product inside, it's just a different company. The dyes come in different sizes, you can buy the large pots, I tend to buy um, lots of the smaller pots. So the wool, what we're dyeing today is a standard four ply um, strong soft base. And as a little bonus, I'm going to show you how I dye, because it's exactly the same, but I just wanted to show the dyeing effects can be different on different bases, so the colours can change. So I'm going to show you how I do the how the teal turns out on the um, tweed base. So this contains the Donegal nap, um, and it's also a darker wool because it contains um, some viscose and some different materials. Um, so as I've said, I'm doing teal today, so I'm going to make up a stock solution. Well, actually, the first thing you want to do is soak your wool. So this was take two, so the wool is already soaking. So what I have in here is the Donegal and the standard base. This is tepid water, it's not too hot, it's not hot and it's not cold, it's blood temperature. You don't want to shock the yarn, you want to make sure it's just going in a nice, gentle, warmish bath. What I did before I added the wool was add a tablespoon of citric acid, mix it up to make sure it's dissolved and then soak the wool. The citric acid just allows you, it, not, it just allows you to, it allows the yarn to take the acid out a bit more quickly. What you don't want to do is put the yarn in and then add the citric acid. If it is an acid, then it can affect the wool, so you don't want it sitting there like a whole tablespoon or sprinkles of it all over the wool. Add the wool once the citric yeah. acid is dissolved in the water. So this is now completely done, so it's nice and soaked. That's had about 15 minutes. You can, I find if I'm doing more than one skein that um, it, gets, I, it gets tangled and it gets messy in the sink, so I like to do them in a loose um, skeins formation and this just allows I can have two in there and they're not going to get all mixed up that's the, that's the basic of it and when you're dyeing lots of yarn you don't want to be standing there separating the skeins so what I'll show you now is how I make up actually bring this over how I make up my stock solution starting and having to look at them today. Okay, this should be fine. So I have one clean. There's no remnants of previous dye jobs in here. These bottles are good. They have a nice um, rotary open and close. Um, and it's a nice nozzle so you can apply, I know later on, you can apply it directly to areas of the wool. That's how I do my bronze goddess dye. So all of these have the same uh, concentration of dye. So these ones have a one quarter teaspoon, 
half a t uh, of dye, half a tablespoon or so of citric acid, add a little water, mix it, swirl it around, make sure the dye is dissolved, there's no dry powder sitting on top, and just top it up. So let's do that. So what I need to do is get my quarter teaspoon measurement. I'm going to do a stronger one today because I'm not sure how the Donald Ball will take it. But all I will do is add a little less to the pot initially. So this one, for a stronger, for my version of a stronger solution, so there's one eighth of a teaspoon in there. About two one quarters. Then I'm going to add a little bit of citric acid. This is the tricky part. I mean, I probably want to get a smaller spoon. It might be easier for a while. And I'm just going to add some. So the more acid you add, the faster the hit rate of the dye is going to be. So that's it there. I'm just going to add a little bit of water up to that now. So there, I've added just a, a, a centimetre or so of water and just giving it a mix. You don't want to be adding dye when there's dry powder sitting on top because you'll just have a very dark spot and it's a bit difficult. So in there you can see the dye has dissolved. So I'm now just going to top this up. I like to use tepid water, the same as I did for the rule. And that's your done. So I would say, I'm using a disclaimer here. I didn't put my mask on because you wouldn't be able to hear me very well. And two, I've been doing this a while now and I was quick enough. I put the lid back on when I was finished and I'm, st I'm standing away. I'm not really standing right up close to the workshop, if you know what I mean. So we've made the dye, well, we've made the dye solution. Oh, I wish it was really covered. There we go. And now what I have here is a pot. So because this is a, a submersive method, I'm adding about four inches of water to this pot. So the skein will come out ring on back then. Though I don't want to put the front ring on like I did before, this was the ring the pot's melted to it over rookie mistakes. Um, so I like to use cup measurements to add the dye. So I use a half a cup measure and what I do is I always hold it over the pot that I'm using and I pour it in. So because this is a immersion method you don't have to apply to the rule. This is how I do my immersion. It's probably different or maybe different from how other people do it. So there's half a cup. So you want to watch for drips, make sure you're only getting it on top of the towel. Add it in and give it a mix. This ring on as well. I'm just going to add water here. So this ring is on. This ring I've already added citric acid to, this pot, sorry. So I sh you can see me adding it here. I add it to the pot. It's only one skin of rule, so it's about half a tablespoon. Again, the same rule applies. If you're adding citric acid to something you're dyeing or soaking, make sure it's dissolved before you add the rule. And it dissolves very quickly, I'm saying that, but you just don't want to damage. The rule is expensive. You're taking the time out to actually dye them. You just don't want to ruin it by having the rule break up on you. So what we have here is the clear pot. You can see it stains the pot, but it's fine. It doesn't transfer. And this is the pot that I've put the tear in. Now I think that looks a bit weak, so I'm probably going to add more. But what I like to do, I'll show you when the rule is ready. I have a little my method of how I dye the wool to get an even coating. So on this pot, put this here, and you should be able to see me adding the dye. My new webcam is great, it clips on everything. So again, 
similar amount of water to a half a cup of the dye. I always love that bit when the dye hits the water. Give it a mix. You don't want to have it sitting with stronger concentrations of dye in one area and then the other because you'll be able to pick it up that way. So I'm now going to put my gloves on. I am using rubber gloves, but they are strong and thick rubber gloves. If you are at all concerned about handling the wool, use heat resistant gloves. I can't say that enough. Okay, so you're just getting my big tummy in the way. Instead of my face, see how far back I can step. Get my chin, hello, chinny chin. So I put my gloves on. The wool is not hot at the moment. What you don't want to do is start having to manipulate the wool and also trying to, I'm just going to put this in the proper way for a minute. You don't want to be ready to take the wool out and then struggle with the rubber gloves. So they're going on now. So over at the sink, I have the two skeins that are soaked. I'm just squeezing out some of the excess water and I'm now just going to open it out into a skein, eh, into an open ring. And when it's wet, wool is not always the easiest to handle, especially with big thick rubber gloves on. So you want to open it up, you want to find your, find your ties, and there you go. Here's your open skein. Now, what I like to do is take the skein and start dunking it in the water, into the dye bag, so you can see the colours. And I just keep doing this until the dye exhausts for the first time. Yeah, I think I made that too weak. I think I may have got the concentration of wrong around. But it just shows how easily it's done. So the dye bath is almost exhausted. So I'll just keep doing this until it exhausts completely. So I'll just keep moving it round. So what the acid has done here has allowed the the yarn fibres to take up the dye and to fix them with the heat. Okay, so what I will do now is I'll hang that there and I'll prepare another half cup. Now what you don't want to do is let the water boil. You just want a nice simmer. So I'll take, lift the yarn back out the way I was dropping it in. I will now add another half cup of dye. I just find I get a much more even coverage doing it this way rather than just plumping the whole thing in. So although it's not truly immersion, I would call this dip immersion because it will be immersed because you have to let it sit for a while. Oh, it's getting quite steamy. So yeah, this may need a few but this is how I ensure that each skein comes out the same and comes out the colour I want. So it's kind of like a multi-layered approach, but with one colour. So again, the dye is dissolved. So this time I'm just adding the dye because I can tell the colour as the water's going to go. It's about half a cup. And that's what I'm doing with one handed. And we just go in again. So you just keep moving the skein round. This is why the thick rubber gloves for this method help. So you can see the colour of the water. I'm really exhausted. But I'm happy with the colour now. It's the, that would be teal in colour. So I'll put this here again. I'm just going to move it round. Oops. Sorry about the steamy windows. It's not so easy on your own. So that's how I do that method. I'm so sorry about the wobbling. It's ridiculous. So what I'll do now is just add a little more teal to the water bath. And this should bind. 
to any of the residual white fibers because this now just sits in the immersion bath. So I'm going to turn the temperature off. There's enough heat in the water. Temperature's off. I've laid the skein in an open formation, which means it's a bit easier to get out. So you can see there's a gap in the middle. So it's not going to be sitting in one big tangled mess. And now it's the time for the, the, the tweed one. So as I say, the colours will be different. Now, I actually enjoy doing a more washed-out colour on the tweed because I happen to think the beige natural colour of the base is quite attractive. And I quite like having it quite tonal so that the base shows through, but that's not everyone's cup of tea. They don't like washed-out wool. So this one, because it's the tealing, that would be tealing colour ray, I'm going to do a strong dye like I've done on this one. So I'm just going to turn this ring down that's up to temperature and here we go again. So you see already it looks very different. There are different colours, there's yellows in the natural fibre so it's taking on a slightly different tone. So this is why this will be a stronger dye base in order to get the colours to come a bit more true of the dye. Now I've never been to art school I was never very good at art, so colour theory isn't my strongest subject. But after having done this for about a year, you, you just pick it up and you know what works for you, you know what doesn't work. So I'm just going to take the lid off the die this time. This is why you need really good heat resistant gloves, because you couldn't do this method without gloves on or without really good gloves on. Marigolds won't do. So I've added all of the remaining dye, which is probably about two cups. Excuse the noise, I'm still a little bit of water. I find this so enjoyable and so relaxing. Sorry, let me get this, you don't want to be listening to that. Though. You don't want to be listening to water sizzling and bubbling away. Um, yeah, so there's actually quite a bit of dye left in this. The colour is more similar to this one now. We'll do a side by side comparison and you'll see why I decided to show you on two different bases. If you were to do this teal colour ray on the bronze goddess base, it would be different again because that is a, a much browner natural base. So the next step, once this is set, is I take it out while it's still hot but I adjust the temperature in the sink slowly. So I'll put the tap on quite warm, like similar temperature. Just let it run through, let it rinse out any excess dye, which there's not going to be any in either of them because the, I always let the dye exhaust and I don't use loads of it. Um, and just bring the temperature down very gradually. If you're at all unsure, if you're worried about the wool felting, let it go cold. I've been doing this for a little while. I know what this particular yarn can take. Um, so yeah, know your products. So I'm just going to put the hot tap on now. Since these aren't for selling, I'm actually needing these. This one's actually the competition winner's one. She's requested the Donegal Nap. So this will be nice. You can see it from start to finish for um, Final Herald Mage, the winner of the last podcast. So. I'll see if I can push the camera back to get more in view. So what I'm going to do is just very slowly over the pot, and again, I am, be careful, do not do this. Let it go cold. So I'm just squeezing out the excess hot water. I'm using the spoon at the other end to support it and to help keep the natural shape. And what I'm doing, I have the tap on hot, and I'm just going to stand here, I'm just going to run the water over and then I'm gradually reducing the temperature. I don't want to shock the wool. It's super wash, it's very unlikely you're ever going to manage to um, felt it but you don't want to risk it. So I'm just very slowly bringing the temperature down. So the next step will then be washing. You want to make sure, especially with blues, greens and reds, you tend to find there's an awful, awful lot of dye that comes off during washing and if you don't wash it properly you will end up um, having people complaining because they have 
the dye on their fingers while they're knitting with it, and that's not what anyone wants. You don't want to be knitting with something that's going to come off on your fingers. Okay, so you can see here, the water is now okay, and this yarn would be okay to handle. So I'm just going to pop the plug in the sink. Now, I don't like applying the soap to the wool. I don't think that's a good idea. So this is um, red cherry and orchid scent, and it's actually quite nice. That was a little bit much. You just want a few drops, just get a little bit of bubbly stuff going on. Oh, that does smell really nice. And then you just want to start washing the wool. Now, it will certainly give you a good workout, I'll tell you that. Especially, I tend to do three or four skeins at a time when I'm washing them. So I'll have three or four in my hands all together. And all I'm going to do is just gentle agitation. Again, if you're worried about the oven, just be very careful. I know this wool. I know how the washing works. So I can be a little bit rougher. Actually, I'm not even being rough. I'm just popping it in and out of the water. So because I've not added absolute silly amount of dye, you can see that the water is actually just soapy. There's no blue teal colour in there. Which means, instead of going straight to rinse, I will just leave this to the side with a little bit of soapy product still in it. Okay, here, and what I will do is go and check on this one. So yeah, we'll have a look, and you can see here, the dye bath is exhausted. Now it looks more grey, but it's actually a reflection of the lights and now steam. So I'm just going to do exactly the same thing off camera here, just so I can do it quickly. So here we go, I have that would be tealing. So there is subtle changes between them, but not a lot. So anyone who would be wanting the tweed base would hopefully expect that they would not be identical to the other one, to any other base. They're all very subtly different in their own way. And I keep loving this one at the moment. This is definitely going in the shop. So just washing it again, just be gentle, you don't need to be wringing it out, you don't need to be squeezing it for an inch of its life. You're just wanting to get any excess dye out, and I tend to find just dumping it in and out like this does the job beautifully. So I'll take the cut out now, and this is where the two-handed action comes in. So I've got two skeins on one hand. All I'm going to do is just start rinsing away the bubbles. Yeah, I've got a little bit too much washing liquid in there. I'm a bit eager. It does smell lovely. I wouldn't pass it putting that on my dishes though. It would probably taste like a monkey. All you want now to do is to rinse off the soap. So I will probably give this, because no dye came off, I'm not going to do the soapy wash, but I will rinse it a few times. If you've got any soapy residue, it can be felt on the, the wool. Um, and if it's a knitted garment that doesn't necessarily need washed or blocked, you might feel kind of a, a, a bit sticky, but I would say there might be a rough feeling, a rough quality to the wool. So I always rinse two or three times. So again, just like with the washing, I'm just dunking it in and out, and they're very heavy at this size. Again, another rinse. This can't be terribly exciting for you, but I'm trying to be as detailed as possible so that anyone wanting to can just take some notes or memorise the information or take their computer to the kitchen like I sometimes do and they can do step by step and they can do this with either the hand dyeing tutorial, the hand painting tutorial or this semi-emerging method. So what I would like to know is what other dyeing techniques you would like to see. Do you want to see resistance methods? Do you want to see different types of emerging methods? Would you like to see a self-striping whenever I get around to learning how to do that? 
I would like you guys to let me know, and I would love any feedback and any comments that you have to make, or that you feel I should know underneath. I also have a podcast. It's called This Boy Podcast. Um, you will find it in my channel details if you're watching this video. Um, you can find me on Etsy as This Boy, where I sell all my wool and all my bags and stitch markers occasionally. You can find me on Instagram as This Boy or David Rakes. And I'll put all those details below. So I just want to show you one more thing. I'm going to take out my one and put it in my seven here. And I'll take the Donegal sheet out of this off camera. And this is how I help dry the wool. So there are different techniques. Some people, because I don't really want to do um, a lot of squeezing and wringing, I have my trusty idea salad spinner. Now I've gone through a few salad spinners, a few salad spinners trying to figure out the best one to use and so far the IKEA one is the best, I have to say. I've got an expensive one and it just goes too darn fast and so what I'm going to do here, as you can see in the basket, I'm going to lay the wool in circular formation, sort of, sort of like when it went into the pot because I want to keep it open in the centre so that it will allow me to actually remove sorry, it will actually allow me to remove the skin at the end still in a relatively open formation. So what I've done there is just left a wing in the middle, made it look like a donut. 